I guess we can uh, start. It's, it's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce Will Perkins, who kindly agreed to give this uh, five lecture uh, course on applications of statistical physics uh, to combinatorics. Will's work is uh, on interface of combinatorics, probability, statistical uh, physics and some algorithmic applications. So it's uh, quite a spectrum of topics and um, I hope he'll uh, illuminate uh, several of the ideas that appeared in his uh, very exciting work recently. Thank you, Will. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to do this. Um, so, so just a couple words about uh, logistics. So I, I'll once more post the uh, lecture notes uh, in, uh, in the chat so you can download this and follow along. I'll be updating this as the lectures go on. And um, I'll try to, what I'm gonna try to do is put more information in the lecture notes than I talk about. And so somehow my, the, the actual live lectures, I'll try to focus on the most important things and maybe uh, guide you to some of the things I'll write in the lecture notes. Um, but uh, please do email me with any comments on the lecture notes or even just put a comment uh, on Dropbox. That would be really nice if you uh, have questions or find mistakes or anything. Um, I'm, I'm sure I have uh, put plenty of mistakes in for you to find. Um, okay, good. So uh, let, me, let me say a little bit about what I want to get across in these lectures. Um, so I, you know, I guess I was trained in combinatorics, but I, uh, in a roundabout way, uh, learned some, some things about statistical physics from some co-authors. And I really, really enjoy the statistical uh, physics way of thinking about things. And um, so the main thing I wanna get across in these lectures is just how do you think like a statistical physicist? Uh, um, what are the objects that they, that they work with? And it turns out, I think the nice thing is these objects actually have uh, close counterparts in combinatorics. And so, you know, the very first thing I wanna do is just get you familiar with the terminology they use in statistical physics and how it relates to terminology you're used to in combinatorics. So that's the most basic level just in between the two. Um, but the statistical physics perspective on things and the way of thinking um, is really a little bit different than the combinatorial way of thinking. And statistical physicists think in terms of um, maybe most of all correlations. And so I wanna say, I wanna describe to you just what questions are they interested in and uh, what happens if we view our favorite combinatorial problems from that perspective. Uh, and then finally, uh, as the lectures go on, I wanna say, well, if you do take this perspective, the statistical physics perspective, um, what can you do in combinatorics? How can you develop some new methods? Maybe what new questions can you ask? Um, but so that's, that's, the, that's the plan. And uh, please do as we go on, like ask questions, uh, say things you're more interested in or, or so on. Okay, so I'll share my screen now. And today's talk will be um, about the fundamentals of statistical physics. So what are the basic objects? What, is the, what are the basic questions they ask? What are some examples of statistical physics models? Um, and, and then how do you translate these basic ideas to combinatorics? Um, okay, let me just open the chat. Okay, great. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, so we'll go through these topics, uh, the introduction, you know, where does statistical physics come from? What is, what is the main goal of statistical physics? Then these objects, Gibbs measures, partition functions, um, and then, then, you know, maybe the most interesting part will be the, uh, the part about the marginals, correlations, and phase transitions. So this, these are really, I think, key, key things to know to understand the st statistical physics way of thinking. Um, okay, and, and feel free to follow along in the lecture notes. I'll try to uh, go in that order. Uh, so what is statistical physics? What's the idea? Um, the idea of statistical physics. is to uh, understand the, let's say macroscopic properties of matter uh, via the, the microscopic inter interactions. So if we know how uh, two you know, gas molecules interact with each other, and now we consider a system with a huge number of gas molecules, 
uh, how, do the, how do the particular microscopic interactions of the molecules translate to some macroscopic behavior that we see? We see um, fluid existing in gaseous, uh, liquid, solid states. Can we uh, understand, is there a connection, a direct connection between the microscopic properties and the macroscopic properties? Uh, and that, you know, that's a, a great uh, question in physics, but also a great question in mathematics. Can we define a mathematical model that relies just on the microscopic interactions and actually observe mathematically rigorously uh, these, this macroscopic behavior we expect? Um, and the key idea, I guess, in the development of statistical physics is uh, instead of tracking each individual interaction, let's say each molecule, each particle, Okay, so you could imagine you have a huge system and you want to track the position and momentum and velocity of every particle. Uh, that really will be hopeless. Uh, you know, consider, use randomness. So consider probability distributions on systems of particles uh, that depend on the microscopic interactions. Okay, and so this is this is the idea of say Boltzmann, uh, and then Gib, Gibbs later, and so on. That you can you can read lots of uh, very interesting stuff about the uh, foundations of statistical mechanics. Um, you know, at the very the most basic level, if you have a if you have let's say a gas of non-interacting particles, you could just say uh, let's say a gas of non-interacting particles. The particles are uniformly distributed in, in some volume. So that's that's the idea at the most basic level. Um, but then the interesting thing comes in uh, when you add interactions. And we want to understand these probability distributions that somehow uh, penalize or reward certain types of interactions. Okay, so that's that's a, a, a very brief introduction, um, but it, it's good to keep in mind this goal. Um, can you derive from first principles and some, uh, in some a model that just relies on microscopic properties, can you derive macroscopic properties? And it could be gases, liquids, it could be magnets. There's all sorts of uh, things you might wanna model with statistical mechanics. Okay, um, so let's actually define some things. So uh, the focus now will, uh, for now, will be uh, spin models on graphs. Okay, so statistical mechanics is more broad, but let's let's focus on this for now. Uh, so what is a spin model on a graph? So we have a finite set of spins. Let's call it omega, and so this, you know might be say plus minus one, it might be zero and one, maybe it's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, those are, that's the set of spins. Uh, we have a graph. Okay, and for now, think of any graph you like. Uh, in, in, a, in a moment, we will sort of specialize to lattices, but for now, think of any graph you like. Uh, the config, set of configurations, Uh, will be um, uh, omega to the v or spin assignments to the vertices. So each possible way of assigning spins to the vertices is a configuration. Um, and the next object is an energy function. Uh, or sorry, can... may I ask a question? Yes, please. What, what is... Uh... Omega, what does it stand for? It's just, just a, a set of spins. Minus. So if you like, think of this as minus one, one, or I don't know, zero, one, or one, two, three, four. It's just some finite set. Okay, thanks. 
or think of it as a set of colors, if you like. But we'll, I'll, I'll give plenty of examples uh, in, a, in a second. But, but we're thinking of this finite set of spins as fixed while we're going to vary the graph. OK, so we have a, a Hamiltonian. And this is a function uh, from configurations, from spin assignments to real numbers, but I'll also allow uh, this function to take the value plus infinity. Um, and in this particular uh, case of spin models on graphs, this Hamiltonian has a kind of nice form. So H of sigma, first it's gonna be a sum over vertices, uh, some function. So you, you sum up this function, this function F, let's say F is from, is a function on spins and then use sum over edges. Let's say G of sigma U, sigma P, where G is some symmetric function on uh, pairs of spins. And I'll allow G to take the value plus infinity. One question. Yeah. Uh, can it be uh, attraction and repulsion forces between particles, this function? Yeah, so G, yeah, you're exactly right. So G is going to be what determines the uh, interactions between particles. And in a moment, you'll see it depends on the sign of G, whether this, uh, this interaction is attractive or repulsive. But G, G is the interaction, and F is somehow like some, some bias uh, that you're introducing uh, a, a prior bias on spins. Um, okay, but that's that's the function, the Hamiltonian. Um, and then, uh, so if we, if let me just remark, if G takes the value plus infinity, we say there is a hard constraint in the model. Excuse me, uh, who are F and uh, G? For now, they're just arbitrary functions. Okay. So, uh, so I, I'm I'm starting out with just some very general model. You have arbitrary functions f and g. F f is a function on spins, and g is a function on pairs of spins. And then to specify a certain model, which we'll do uh, very shortly, we will pick certain values for certain functions uh, f and g, and then see what results. But for now, just think there's some arbitrary function. Um, okay, so we have this Hamiltonian, we now define the partition function, and this is somehow the key object uh, in all of this. Okay, the partition function is Z. Uh, there's, a, there's a good reason why it's called Z. I think it has to do with the German language. Um, it depends on the graph G. It depends on some uh, real number beta, uh, and it implicitly de depends on this Hamiltonian function, but I won't write this dependence. And what is it? It's the sum over all configurations, the exponential of minus beta h of sigma. Okay, so uh, again, and I'll, I'll try to do this as we go, uh, point out the combinatorial interpretation. This is some this type of counting object where we have a bunch of configurations, each of which gets some sort of score and we're summing over all the configurations of this score. Uh, so this is, this is really related to uh, a type of counting. Um, but the partition function, this is a key object. Uh, and using the partition function, we can define a probability measure. So the Gibbs measure. It's a probability distribution. On configurations. And it's defined as follows. Um, so mu, let's, okay, I can put G in. I, I really should have beta. Uh, but we will we'll drop the subscripts when we can. Uh, the probability you, you see a particular configuration sigma, so a particular uh, assignment of spins to all the vertices of the graph, it equals e to the minus beta times the energy divided by the partition function. 
Okay. And so of course the partition function is the normalizing constant uh, that ensures that the sum of the, the probabilities is one. Okay, so these are these are the two bit, the basic objects. Um, the Gibbs measure this probability distribution on uh, configurations on spin assignments to vertices, and the partition function, which is this counting object, and also the normalizing constant of this probability distribution. Um, and we will get in in a few minutes. We will first of all see examples, but second, see you know why does it have this form? It has kind of a special form. It's this exponential uh, of this function h, and h has a special form. It's it's sum over vertices and sum over edges. And so there's something about the form and uh, the graph uh, that interact, and we'll see that this is uh, quite important. Um, but but before we discuss that, let's talk a little bit about this parameter beta. So beta is called uh, the inverse temperature. And uh, it, it uh, somehow controls the strength of the interaction. Okay, so a, a couple of special cases. If beta is zero, uh, and here we would say that uh, since this is the inverse temperature, beta equals zero is infinite temperature, uh, then there's no interaction, right? This uh, e to the minus beta h is uh, just one. Uh, and so we get the uniform distribution uh, on assignments. And so the, the spins, we, we can say the spins are independent. Okay, so that's one extreme. If you have infinite temperature, then you just are purely random and you have uh, independent spins. But what if you take beta equals plus infinity? So this would be zero temperature. Uh, and then uh, you're going to put all the weight of your probability measure on uh, configurations that minimize the energy function H. So it's the uniform distribution on ground states. What are those configurations? that minimize H of sigma. Okay, and so the, the whole, you know, the one perspective of this whole setup is that taking beta positive and finite interpolates between two things that we know kind of well in combinatorics, interpolates between independence IID spins and an optimization problem. Okay, find the configuration that um, minimizes this energy. Um, so, you know, if we, if to take an example, and we'll get to this example in a second, but an example would be, you know, on one hand, you could pick a uniformly random cut from a graph. Okay, so cut, I just mean separate vertices into two classes. Uh, that's, that's one very natural experience, experiment we would do in combinatorics, trying to do, uh, apply the probabilistic method, pick a random cut. On the other hand, we could look uh, and we could find a max cut in a graph. One question. A cut in a graph. Mm -hmm. okay, and this is also a very natural combinatorial or computational thing to do. And somehow this Gibbs measure will allow us to interpolate between these two different things. Was, it, was there a question? Yeah, yes. Uh, so do, do you uh, take methods of uh, discrete optimization or do you also uh, consider some continuous <laughs> optimization when you are uh, finding uh, the minimum energy? 
well, configuration uh, which makes the minimum energy? Yeah, so good question. At the moment, I'm, I'm not even saying how would you go about finding the minimum. Uh, I'm just saying we have this finite set of configurations. So there is a minimum or there is, there is a minimum. And I'm just saying uh, that if you take beta to be plus infinity, then this Gibbs measure will put all the, you know, be uniform over the, the set of minimizers. Um, it's quite interesting to think about, you know, how do you find minimizers? Uh, is that an easy or hard computational problem? And so on. But for now, for now, I'm, I won't even uh, talk about that. Um, good. And so, so we have this interpolation and then a, a theme of statistical physics, and I want to emphasize this, a theme is that the qualitative properties, qualitative, properties of the two extremes. So the independence and the optimization, they persist in some, for some range of parameters. So when we take beta equals zero, we have IID spins, but if you take beta small, so you have weak interactions, uh, in, in many, many cases, you still get the qualitative properties of independence, even though you don't have independence. On the other hand, if you take beta very large, but finite, um, while you're not optimizing uh, strictly anymore, the configurations that you see or understanding the partition function, uh, you'll, you'll end up with configurations that are very highly correlated with an op the optimizer. And so this is related, and we'll talk more about this, but this is very much related to the idea of stability uh, in extremal combinatorics. Um, okay, good. So that's, uh, that's somehow the, the general introduction to these two important objects. Uh, what I wanna do next is just talk about some examples. And uh, actually maybe for examples, I'm gonna show you, I'll, I'll just bring up the lecture notes uh, because one thing I, I want you to take away from this is these pictures. Um, okay, because if you have these pictures in mind, uh, I think the concepts uh, will, will come easier. And so, um, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll give you like three or four examples of uh, statistical physics models. Um, and what I said in the lecture notes is to start thinking like a physicist, um, you can imagine that the graph we're talking about is some box in, uh, on the integer lattice ZD or even Z2. Um, all the definitions that we're talking about work for any graph, um, but uh, the perspective of statistical physics is really from something like a lattice. Uh, okay, so our first example, and this is maybe the most important example, um, as we'll see in later lectures, but it's the hardcore model or the hardcore lattice gas. Um, and this is a model, of, it's a toy model of a gas. Um, and what, are, what is the uh, model? So uh, allowed configurations of the model will be uh, independent sets of the graph. So sets of vertices that share no edge. Uh, and then we wanna pick an independent set with probably proportional to some lambda to the size of the inter uh, independent set. So here it says the probability we pick the independent set I is lambda to the size of I over the partition function. And so the partition function here, this is, I think I can write here, this is, so Z, is the independence polynomial. Okay, it's sum over all independent sets, lambda to the size of i. Um, okay, how do we put this model into the framework we just said? Well, our spin set we can take to be just the spin zero and one, zero meaning not in the independent set, one meaning in the independent set. F of zero is zero, F of one is log lambda. So. Uh, and, uh, or, okay, maybe like minus log lambda over beta, but let's, let's forget about beta for now. And then the important thing here is that uh, the, the interaction between spins, we put G of one, one to be plus infinity. So this is a hard constraint and this is why it's called the hardcore model. If you put G of one, one to be plus infinity, that means you exclude any configurations for which there's a one and a one across an edge. In other words, you're forcing this to be an independent set. Uh, and here's, here's a picture to keep in mind. I, I have two samples from the model. 
one when lambda is relatively small and one when lambda is relatively large. And you see, I, I've put white uh, squares to mean unoccupied, uh, blue to be even uh, vertices of Z2. So vertices whose coordinates sum to an even number, blue and uh, odd occupied to be red. You see two very different pictures here. You see some somehow something mixed up and disordered on the left and something very uh, ordered on the right. You see a bunch of blues, a sea of blues with some islands of reds. And this is really, uh, this is really a good picture to keep in mind uh, for this whole, this whole mini course. Good, so that's, uh, that's model one. Um, model two, the easing model. This is a very important model in statistical physics. Uh, here, here right. configurations are um, assignments of plus minus one spins to the vertices of a graph. And so if you think question. of uh, plus one and minus one as assigning vertices to two sets, this is a distribution on cuts of a graph. Uh, and we pick a, a cut with probably proportional to e to the beta times the number of monoch monochromatic edges or number of edges whose vertices receive the same spin. Uh, and so here we can say that g, uh, this function g, of sigma u sigma v is just sigma u times sigma v. So if they're both plus one or they're both minus one, you get a one and otherwise you get a minus one. Um, good, that's the easing model. Sorry, Will, I think there was a question. Oh, good. Oh yeah, the coloring in the previous example, good. Yeah, this is, this is very important. Um, so um, ZD or Z2 is a bipartite graph. Uh, you have just like a checkerboard, you have vertices that are even and vertices that are odd. Even vertices have, the, the, the sum of their coordinates is even, the black squares on a checkerboard, uh, odd squares, their sum of their coordinates are odd, let's say uh, uh, white squares on a checkerboard. And um, what I've, I've done is, you know, you, you have both of these represent independent sets. Uh, the white squares are vertices that are not in the independent set. Blue squares are ones that are in the independent set, but even, and red are ones that are in the independent set, but odd. And you can tell that on the right, uh, we somehow were looking at the biggest independent set, one of the two big independent sets, would, which would be the all even with some perturbations. Okay. So uh, in this model, you know, maybe, maybe it's good to point out in this model, there are two ground states. There's the all even occupied and the all odd occupied ground states. Uh, good. Uh, how about the spins? I think they are, I thought they are just two, uh, two spins, but here we have white, blue, and red. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. So there are just two spins. There's zero and one. Wh white uh, squares are getting the spin zero, and colored red or blue are getting the spin one. But I, I've colored them differently based on uh, some property of the underlying vertex, just to show you uh, just to show you the dramatic difference in configurations. I see, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I wanna mention one model that has more than two spins. So this, uh, a good example is the POTS model. The POTS model is a generalization of the easing model. So here now we have Q uh, colors or spins and Q can be two, three, four, five. Uh, and uh, configurations or assignments of the Q colors to the vertices. And we choose a particular coloring with probably proportional to uh, E to the beta times the number of monochromatic edges. Um, and so here, uh, I think I've, I've done a picture of the uh, four color POTS model on Z2. Uh, and so you see when beta is small, uh, you know, if you look closely, you'll see that vertices do prefer to see the same color next to them, but this preference dies out very quickly. And so uh, on a global perspective, we see very disordered, whereas if beta gets larger, we see on the right, uh, one of the colors dominates and you have these little islands of, um, of uh, other colors. And so this, uh, this again is a good uh, picture just to keep in mind. Uh, as we introduce things. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this now, I won't go into too much detail here, um, but not all Gibbs measures are spin models on graphs. Uh, there's an important model, the monomer-dimer model, which is a, mo a probably distribution on matchings. 
Um, and this is, this is what you would call an edge coloring model. The spins rest on the edges. Um, we'll talk about this more perhaps uh, in the next lecture. Um, there are also models in the continuum. Uh, there's something called the hard sphere model. I'll show you a picture here. And this is, this is somehow the original uh, statistical physics model. Now spins don't rest on vertices of a graph. Uh, we have particles in the continuum and they, they interact with each other in some way. The hard sphere model, the interaction is that they must uh, stay a certain distance apart from each other. It really is an, a hardcore model in a, on an infinite graph. Um, and we may talk about this uh, in the last lecture. Yeah. I didn't understand this comment about like the slide before. Um, what's general spin model like? Oh, I was saying that um, the, the setup that I introdu introduced, configurations were assignments of spins to vertices of graphs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying that this is not always, uh, not all Gibbs measures or statistical physics uh, models fit into that framework. So this monomer dimer model, the configurations are subsets of edges of the graph uh, as opposed to subsets of vertices. Uh, that's one example. The second example was a continuum model. Uh, and then this third example, another example is uh, you can have a spin model, but on a hypergraph. And so maybe instead of interactions happening, happening across edges of graph, they uh, uh, occur across hyper edges. So uh, a natural example to keep in mind would be a hardcore model, independent sets in a hypergraph, weighted by lambda to the size of the independent set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so these three examples are, are very interesting and good to keep in mind, but they don't exactly fit in with the definitions I gave for spin models and graphs. Okay, any other questions about these examples? But for this first one, you can just look at the line graph, no? Yes, very good. Uh, the monomer, yeah, the monomer dimer model is the hardcore model on line graph. And so there are ways to, you're right, for certainly for edge col coloring models, there's some way to switch uh, perspective. I guess one comment that I also wanted to make is that uh, all these functions that you mentioned, these energy functions, uh, can be calculated uh, locally. Yes, uh, yes. So, so this, is, this is the key, as far as I understand. Yes, yes. And we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a moment when we talk about independence properties. But this, this is, you're, you're exactly right that this is key. Let me even scroll up uh, here to emphasize this. The, the, the form of the energy function, it's very important that the form is local. As Andre said, it's sum over fun of functions on vertices plus sum over functions on edges. And all the nice properties and all the nice reasons uh, for studying this type of measures uh, will really rely on, on the fact that this energy function is local. Yeah, thank you for emphasizing that. Okay, so very good. So those are, those are examples to keep in mind. Um, now, okay, maybe, I, maybe I, will, I will not spend too much time on this next section, but I'll, I'll just give you a guide if you're reading along in the lecture notes uh, in the next section. You know, a very natural question to ask is, why does a Gibbs distribution have this form? Okay, why is it this uh, exponential of an energy or you could call this a log linear form? Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways of answering this. Um, okay, so uh, I didn't even finish typing this one, but there's, there's some historical motivation. Uh, and uh, I'll spell that out a little bit more. Um, a, a, a very important uh, reason is number two, and I'll get to this uh, on the, the hand-drawn notes in a second. Uh, I just wanna remark, because I find this kind of interesting, is uh, number three is, is this an optimal distribution in some sense? And, and this is quite interesting. So um, it turns out that, uh, and those, this was written in a paper in the 50s or 60s by someone named James. Um, it turns out that one way to characterize Gibbs measures uh, is that they are entropy maximizing distributions subject to some expectation constraints. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Um, so if you look at all probability distributions on configurations uh, that have the property that the expectation 
of your energy function. Okay, now you think of the energy as a random variable. Uh, the, the expectation of the energy equals some number B. Uh, then the distribution, overall distribution satisfying that constraint that maximizes the entropy, just the Shannon entropy, is a Gibbs measure. It has the form E to the minus beta times energy over some normalizing constant. And so this is some like, I guess, I don't know, very general reason why this is a useful, interesting measure to study is that it's entropy maximizing. Um, so ex for example, the easing model is the entropy maximizing probability distribution on cuts that uh, subject to a given mean number of edges cut, for example. Um, and here, if you, if you wanna sort of work through it yourself, uh, th there's a, a, a short exercise, let GN be the set of all graphs on N vertices. What is the entropy maximizing distribution on graphs with a given mean number of edges? Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, do that at some time on your own, but you'll see an uh, object that you, are, that you know and love come out of that. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, is this the uh, distribution, the distribution of uh, search space? Yeah. Say, say that again. Is uh, the okay. distribution that you're talking about, is the Rather distribution than... of uh, ah, search space? It's random. I mean, uh, we have uh, we have configurations, uh, right? Yeah. So every configuration is uh, is one uh, <laughs> uh, like a candidate. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no one candidate solution well, for us. Uh, so they shape all together the, uh, a space the main, which we search uh, yeah. inside them yeah. uh, to find friend? the best candidate, right? Uh, yeah. And when you Who talk was, about uh, the distribution. Uh, uh, you mean the distribution of uh, this search space? How candidates are uh, distributed in our more. space? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, this, this becomes a rather complicated optimization problem. It turns out it's a convex problem, though. And, and so it turns out that there is a unique entropy maximizing distribution, uh, which is kind of nice. Okay. Um, Good, but I, I, want to, I want to go in a little bit more detail about this second uh, property, which is why are they useful? And this relates exactly to what Andre uh, mentioned about the form of the distribution. And so uh, a, a Gibbs measure, a spin model of this form has a, very, uh, a really nice property, which is imagine you, uh, imagine you have a partition of your vertices. Uh, so a vertex partition. Um, so that B, this set B is a vertex separator. So, you know, there's edge, there may be edges in A, there's edges in B, there's edges in C, and there's edges between A and B, there's edges between A and C, but no edges between A and C. Okay, and then the, the special property of the Gibbs measure is that uh, conditioned on I'll call it sigma b. And so sigma b now, this is uh, the set of spins of b. Sigma a and sigma c are independent. Okay, so this, this is uh, uh, another way of saying this is, this is a Markov random field. Uh, and this is an extremely important um, property and very useful. In particular, like, you know, the most basic example of this is if you have some vertex in your graph and you know the spins, you condition on the spins of your neighbors, then the spin of V is independent of everything else and you can calculate, um, say, the, the conditional probability that it takes different spins. Okay, and this, you know, you can think of some very natural probability distributions on spin configurations that don't have this property. So for example, not true uh, for uh, picking a uniformly random independent set of size K. Okay, so clearly if you fix the size of your independent set, 
then you, you can get some correlations just because if you know a vertex somewhere far away is in the independent set, there's fewer, you can have fewer independent sets, uh, fewer vertices occupied elsewhere. Um, and so there's a good reason why we want to look at um, probability distributions of this form. Uh, good. Okay, good. So the next, the next topic will be uh, marginals and correlations. And this is starting to get into uh, really the statistical physics perspective on things. Um, so, and for now, let's stick to uh, two spin models. So, you know, either hardcore, you can think, or easing. Okay, and so, uh, you know, because I, if you have two spins, then you can describe a probability distribution on the set of spins just by its expectation. Uh, and so that's what I wanna say. And so what is the marginal? Marginal of V, we'll call it mu V, and this will just be the expectation of the spin at vertex V, okay? And so in the case of hardcore, mu v, well, it's, you know, you're, you're one if you're occupied, zero if you're unoccupied. So this is just the probability that v is in the random independent set i. So it's the marginal. Uh, good. Joint marginal. Am I right that spins are always uh, numbers? So they're, they're real numbers, right? Always. Yeah, so certainly for this discussion, they should be, yes. Um, I mean, you'll see, I, I, okay, a, a remark is that let's, let's say you have more than two spins, then, then the marginal shouldn't just be a number, it should be some probability distribution on spins. Uh, and so you could take that, that as really the definition of a marginal, it's a prob probability distribution on spins, and then they don't have to be real numbers. But, but it's, it's nice, it's convenient to just, uh, at least for two spin models, to think of them as real numbers, and so we can write that expectation. Okay, thanks. Okay, joint marginal. Now we want to know how do how do two uh, spins at two different vertices interact? The joint marginal mu u v is the expectation of sigma u sigma v. So for hardcore, this would be mu u v is the probability that u uh, that v is in the independent set and u is in the independent set. Um, so that's a joint marginal, and then you can you can have a, a joint marginal of some subset. So let's say mu s is the expectation of the product v and s of sigma v. And for hardcore, this would be the probability that s is completely contained in the independent set. Okay, so these are these are the basic objects, the marginals and joint marginals, um, and and notice that uh, it is not necessarily easy to calculate this. Um, you know, we we have some nice conditional independence properties, but really these marginals and joint marginals depend on the entire structure of the graph and depend on the parameters, um, and so it's it's not not easy. In, in some cases, there might be some symmetry or something that lets you calculate it, but in general. It's not clear uh, how to calculate this besides summing over all the configuration. Okay, and what we're really interested in is the strength of correlations between vertices. Uh, as a function of a, a few things. Uh, the parameters of the model, the underlying graph, and the distance, let's say, between U and V in the graph. Okay, and so if you if you have this statistical physics perspective that we're looking at Z two or something, we want to know. Um, as u and v, uh, if they're far apart or if they're close together, 
how does this change the correlation? And how do we measure the correlation? Uh, there's something uh, we'll look at some sort of covariance between them. Um, and so let's see. So we're going to say kappa of uv is mu uv minus mu u mu v. Okay, and uh, the physics word for this would be the truncated two point correlation function. Okay, so mu uv is the two point correlation function, kappa of uv uh, subtracting off the product of the marginals. This is the truncated two point correlation function. And of course, if sigma u and sigma v were independent, then, then we would have kappa of uv equals zero. So it's a measure. So somehow the absolute value of kappa uv is a measure of dependence. OK, and the next is a key definition. You say um, the model, so let's say mu g exhibits exponential decay of correlations. If there exists constants a, b, so that the absolute value of kappa u, v is less than a e to the minus b times the distance between u and v. Um, so we, we have exponential decay of the, the absolute value of this truncated two-point correlation function. And here, really, I'm thinking uh, this is a definition for a, an infinite sequence of graphs. So maybe boxes in ZD getting bigger and bigger, uh, where the constants, uh, let's say graphs of GN, where the constants A and B are independent of N. So of course you can always, if you just have one graph, you can always find A and B, but we want something uniform. Uh, we want this to hold for a sequence of graphs or for even uh, for an infinite graph if we uh, define an infinite volume that gives measure. Okay, so any questions about that? That's somehow a, a key concept. And we want to understand when do we have exponential decay of correlations and when do we not have exponential decay of correlations? You are saying that it only makes sense to think about this if it's not for a specific graph G. The sequence. Yeah, a family of graphs. Um, but this is this is also what we do in combinatorics, right? We we think of uh, graphs depending on n getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, like the the hypercube is it, it's not one graph; it's a sequence of graphs. Or g n one half is not one; it's a sequence of distributions on graphs. And so what I'm saying is that when you make a definition like this, you want a and b to be independent oh, of okay, okay. Uh, n. Yeah. Meaning whenever both one and in the result, it, it refers to this kind of setting in combinatorics generally. It's just yeah. n are not dependent on n. They are just constants, absolute constants. Exactly, a and, a and b are just constants independent of n. Yeah, that's important. Um, good. So is there, um, is there a way to link it with your three examples? Because I know there's no sequence of graphs there, but maybe you could look at uh, increasing box sizes in Z2. Um, yes, that's exactly right. So that, that's actually, if you, if you scroll to the next section in the lecture notes, that's exactly what we'll, we'll say. So uh, I drew a picture of one, one box, but you're exactly right. What the picture you should have in mind is boxes getting bigger and bigger. And you wanna know if this A and B exist for all boxes as you get bigger and bigger. Very good. Um, so yeah, so the next, the next topic and, and probably the last topic for the day will be uh, phase transitions. And the first thing I wanna say is uh, phase transition is an infinite volume phenomenon.
So it's a phenomenon in the n to infinity limit. Okay, so you, you, don't, you don't say that there's a phase transition on one fixed graph. You say there's a phase transition on an infinite graph or there's a phase transition in the limit as n goes to infinity. And you know, one way to think of it is lambda n, capital lambda n is the box in ZD of side length uh, n. And you consider uh, the, these Gibbs measures. So mu lambda n, z lambda n as n goes to infinity. Um, okay, and uh, you know, for, for lambda n, we can put boundary conditions. on the model, meaning I have this box and maybe I specify some of the spins on the boundary. I say these ones, these, these vertices have to take uh, color red or these vertices have to be occupied in the independent set. Um, and now uh, under very general conditions, two things are true. So one, um, mu n, or mu lambda n has a weak limit, a weak subsequential limit. Uh, as a, a measure on omega to the ZD um, as n goes to infinity. So you can define um, a Gibbs measure on an infinite graph. Clearly it doesn't make sense with the uh, definition I gave, but as a weak limit of finite uh, Gibbs measures, uh, and, and these exist. Second is that the following function, uh, this limit exists. So f of beta is the limit as n goes to infinity, one over the number of vertices of lambda n log of the partition function, log z lambda n. Um, so this, uh, this will be called the free energy or the pressure. And under very general conditions, this limit exists and actually doesn't depend on the sequence of boundary conditions. Okay, and so this is, this is what we mean by looking at uh, uh, the infinite volume limit, looking at the, the free energy. Uh, okay, so the properly scaled uh, version of the log partition function and looking at infinite volume Gibbs measures. And so the last thing I'll say today is just three definitions of a phase transition. Okay, so the first is that um, we have disorder versus order. And so we say a phase transition occurs at some critical parameter of the inverse temperature. If you think about hardcore, this could be a lambda critical. If uh, for beta less than beta C, we have exponential decay of correlations. but not for beta greater than beta C. Okay, so again, this, this relies on this definition of decay of correlations being uniform uh, over these graphs lambda n. So if you have exponential decay of correlations, but then all of a sudden you don't have exponential decay of correlations, this transition point is a phase transition. Uh, second would be that uh, I guess the uniqueness perspective. Is there one or more than one uh, infinite volume Gibbs measure? Or in other words, uh, can you get two different or more than two? Gibbs measures 
by taking different boundary conditions. And so for something like uh, the easing model, you could say, let's put all plus boundary conditions on the outside. Uh, does that lead to a different infinite volume Gibbs measure than putting all minus boundary conditions on the outside? Or you could say hardcore model, take all even occupied vertices on the outside. Does that lead to a different infinite volume Gibbs measure to taking all odd occupied on the outside? Okay, and finally, um, analyticity. This is quite interesting, I think. So we can say a phase transition occurs at beta c, the function f of beta is non-analytic at beta c. And so if it um, yeah, so uh, this would be a phase transition sort of defined analytically. Is it an analytic function or not? And if you have a non-analytic point, then we say there's a phase transition. A first order phase transition is that uh, F prime of beta is discontinuous. And second order phase transition, F double prime of beta is discontinuous. I think there are some exotic type of phase transitions where um, you can be non-analytic, but all your derivatives are continuous. Uh, but uh, let's not get into that. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is- oh, Sorry, th th there is a question in the chat oh, and no good. one you want to answer it. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I do want to answer it. Is the property of having exponential uh, correlation decay monotone in beta? Uh, in this very general setup, uh, this is a very good question. In this very general setup that we've talked about, the answer is no. Uh, and so for example, it's, it's not known in, for the hardcore model on ZD, whether there's just one phase transition, okay? But for things like easing model, we do know that it's monotone. Uh, there's like uh, some in correlation inequalities that you, can you prove it? But in, in this very general setting, the answer is no. Um, but for, certainly for some specific examples, we can prove it, but not for other very simple examples. So it's a great question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Will. Yeah. Um, okay, and maybe the last thing I'll say is just this analytic stuff is uh, related to complex analysis, to the complex zeros of, the, of partition functions, so Z of beta. And this is the Li Yang theory theory of phase transitions. So in particular, you know, we have this um, partition function, which we know is always positive on the positive real axis. So you can't have a zero, um, but in the complex plane, you can have zeros and you can only have a phase transition if as, in, in, as the sequence of graphs lambda n, uh, n tends to infinity, if you have zeros that condense onto the real axis. Or in other words, the, the, the converse, if you have a, a zero free region uniformly in N, you can't have a phase transition. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, so I'll, I'll end there. And uh, uh, next time I'll start up with what's left here and then go on to the second lecture. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Will. Uh, questions? So this uniqueness, can you explain it again? Sorry. Yeah, so let, let me explain a little bit more like concretely. Uh, so let's let's take a model, a nice model, let's say the, the hardcore model, and you, you have this box in, in uh, ZD, and here I can even draw it. So you have ZD and you have two different boundary conditions. You have even occupied and odd occupied. Okay, and let's say the origin Right, the zero, zero, that's an even vertex. So somehow with the, you're more likely to be occupied, more likely the origin is occupied in the, in the left case when you have the all even occupied boundary conditions. I, I think that's an exercise I gave you in the lecture notes. But the question now is, uh, does this more likely persist as n goes to infinity? If you take the boxes bigger and bigger, do you see a noticeably noticeable preference for the origin being occupied 
in the sequence of boundary conditions even occupied compared to odd occupied. If that vanishes, then you have uniqueness. But if that persists, then you have non-uniqueness. So Will, I, I guess uh, one might ask what the boundary conditions were for the hardcore model pictures that you showed, but actually they look like the ones that Peter Shore and I generated 30 years ago. And if so, those were actually on the torus. Very good. You are correct. Uh, okay, that's impressive. Yeah. So this, that's right. So there's another type of boundary condition you can put on. You can put periodic boundary conditions where instead of working with a box, you're a torus. You, you know, the vertex on the left and the top are the same as bottom on right. I, I did not realize it was possible for someone to look at a picture and deduce that, but it turns out it is possible. That's correct. Um, you said the, the Haar sphere model was an infinite graph. Um, yeah. What is an infinite graph? So uh, you can imagine, let's just take a box in Euclidean space. The vertices are just points in Euclidean space. So an uncountable number of vertices and the, the edges are, you put an edge between two points if their distance is less than R. And, and then if you have somebody occupied, that means there's a, a center of a sphere there, you exclude centers in the ball of radius R. Um, yeah, so. So just a follow up question to the, to the boundary conditions. So the uniqueness, when you have this uh, torus model, the uniqueness is kind of the same for a reasonable. You have to be a bit careful because the torus is, is just one particular boundary condition. And so, so to talk about uniqueness, non-uniqueness, you need to allow for multiple different boundary conditions. Um, there are ways to define phase transitions in terms of toruses. And there, you know, you can certainly talk about decay of correlations in the torus, uh, or you can talk about um, somehow what do typical configurations look like. Uh, are, um, but decay of correlations, I guess, would make most sense on the torus. But, but you can't really talk about non-uniqueness and uniqueness because that's one specific choice of boundary condition. Right, but if you do have uniqueness for the boundary conditions, then you should have it for periodic uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, right. So if you do have uniqueness, then the limit you get from the torus will be the same as you get from any other boundary condition. Okay. Yeah. The question, I don't know if it's possible to answer quickly, but uh, can you explain this analyticity uh, phase transition? Because it looks the most uh, exotic to me as a non-analytical non person. Yes. Uh, okay. So let me see. Um, what do I want to say? So do you mean, exp so uh, kind of give some intuition on why this is a phase transition? Yeah, so, um, so what we'll see next time at the beginning of next time, which I didn't get to today is that this, uh, if you look at this function f of beta, right, this is this limit um, of uh, the one over n log partition function. Uh, okay, that's, that's something that somehow measures I don't know, the partition function. But if you take a derivative, you, you get a, a statistic about the model. And so uh, in particular, you, the F prime gives you the scaled expected energy of a random configuration from the model. And so what does it mean if that's discontinuous? It means as you change your parameter beta, all of a sudden you see a dramatic change in one of the statistics of the model. So an observable, we would call it. Um, and, and then you can, if you take different derivatives or you, you know, put some other parameters in the model, you can somehow, any macroscopic uh, thing that you would like to observe, you can phrase in terms of derivatives of log partition functions. And then discontinuities means that behavior changes dramatically at this point. Okay, okay, yeah, I understood, thanks. That's not my answer. Any more questions? Yeah, so how does this relate to the sort of sharp thresholds that people talk about in uh, random graph theory? Uh, that's a good question. So a sharp threshold is, is certainly a phase transition. Um, 
right? Because you have some function that uh, is zero, 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 and then all of a sudden jumps to some other value. Um, so it's certainly related. Um, you know, you could even say like the giant component emerging from uh, in the erdos rainy random graph, this is a phase transition. If you look at like the scaled size of the largest component, you have a function that's zero, 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 and then it, it emerges. And so there's a discontinuity in the first derivative or something. Um, so you certainly can phrase it in terms of this language. Of course, uh, the graphs that you can, random graphs are, are different than lattices, but there's a, there's a, a great uh, field of statistical physics people applying their intuition and ideas to random graphs. And, and you can deduce a lot of cool things from this perspective as well there. So, but, so is one definition more general than the other one or they just have some interaction and it's not completely clear? Uh... Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So if you're a physicist, you would just say that these three definitions are equivalent. But yep. then if you really try to like pin down uh, the things, it, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and certainly in some cases and in some level of general, generality, they are equivalent. But in other cases, it's either not known or it's, it's not strictly true. Uh, and so it's, it's, not, it's, it's not like a theorem that these are equivalent, but morally they are equivalent. I have a couple questions. Yeah. So firstly, um, it seems like uh, the partition function is very much like a moment generating function. Yes. Uh, so first question is like, what is the connection there? And the second one is uh, besides moment generating functions, there's also the complex version, right? Where you have the e to the negative i beta. And yeah. so they're also kind of like an analogous thing for partition functions. Yeah, so, um, I, I, so the second thing you talked about is characteristic function. And yes. I haven't really seen how that's used with these models, but certainly the, the analogy to moment generating function is very good. It is a moment generating function, basically. It's a moment generating mm -hmm. function of the random variable that's the random energy, um, the energy of a random configuration. And so that uh -huh. the very first thing we'll do in the next lecture will be to talk about what happens when you start to take derivatives of the log partition function? And sometimes, and the log moment generating function is, I guess, called the cumulant generating function. Um, it's just the log of the moment generating function. And it turns out derivatives of this give you a, a bunch of information about moments of this random variable that's the random energy. And so you're exactly right that there's a very strong connection. And this will, this will tell us a lot of interesting uh, information about the probabilistic properties of the model just by doing analytic stuff to the partition function. Okay, I got you, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll, then that's it for the first lecture and uh, uh, I guess see everybody on uh, Friday and I'm looking forward to the continuation of the course. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see Thanks you a lot, Will. Yeah, thank that was you, great. Will. See you Friday.